when I was in the Navy as a Navy entomologist, I was over in Desert Shield and Desert Storm with the Marines out in the middle of the Saudi desert, absolute middle of the Saudi desert. And there was not one lumen of light out there. And the sky was just breathtaking. I'm telling you, it was just breathtaking. It was really humbling to look at the heavens at that time. What was equally humbling was the fact that one of the least of God's creatures, mosquitoes, were tearing us up. <laughs> out in the middle of the Saudi desert. Those little devils, are, they're adaptable. So, we're going to talk about how to keep you from getting bitten by these mosquitoes. Now, these things have been known for, they've been around for a long time. The fossil record isn't extensive, but 170 million years. And that's not because they're stupid. They're extremely adaptable. They found mosquitoes breeding quite happily, 14,000 feet in the Himalayas, and 3,000 feet underground in mine shaft. Highly adaptable. Uh, we've got 185 species in the United States and Northeast Florida. We have 59 different species of mosquitoes. And we worry about them from the nuisance uh, standard. And when you guys are out there looking at the stars, but disease. We had eight cases of West Nile virus uh, last year. And West Nile virus is a bad disease to get. And uh, it's even worse on people who survive it than people who don't in many cases. Um, sentinel chickens, we had over 75% of our sentinel chickens that tell us when the disease is rampant, uh, zero converted during that time. That was the highest in the United States. So, not only nuisance, but disease. Now, in order to keep these mosquitoes away from us, you really do need to know something about their biology. All mosquitoes have four life stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. This is an egg graft from a Culex pipiens, which is the vector of West Nile virus. But some of them lay them eat, uh, species like the Aedes uh, vexans, which is our most numerous mosquito here lay them in shallow depressions in fields. And when they get, and they, these things can stay on in the ground for, for years, several years, up to five years. I think five years is the max that they've done. It. And when a rain comes and inundates them, then they hatch out. And they hatch out into these, larvae. These are like teenagers. The only thing they do is eat. That's it. And they eat in order to gain the uh, energy to pupate and this is just a factory that produces this out of this. And all mosquitoes go through this. All mosquitoes require water to survive. Okay? Not running water, still water to survive. <coughs> Their reproductive cap capabilities are unbelievable, <coughs> which is why we got so darn many of these things. If you take 80 vexans, four generations, uh, two mosquitoes start out and in four generations, at 16 weeks, even with 75% mortality at each stage, you still have 810 million mosquitoes. <laughs> now, obviously that doesn't happen, except in Susie's place. But um, <laughs> it doesn't happen, so there's a lot of mortality that goes on. But it just shows you that it's incredible. These are all mosquito larvae. I took this. This is about oh, two foot by two foot up. Down four square feet of um, dredge foil right off of Blunt Island. And these are all salt marsh mosquitoes, billions of them. Flight ranges. You need to know about flight ranges too, because you know I have people who say, "Well, I got rid of all the water in my yard. I still got mosquitoes. Well, they're coming from elsewhere." Aedes <coughs> albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, vector of dengue fever and Zika. Um, has about a 500 foot flight range. It's a very, very poor flyer, tends to stay where it breeds. Culex pipiens, the vector of West Nile virus, one mile, our most numerous mosquito to, to five miles. And these two are both saltwater breeders that you find in this area. Look at it, 70 miles. This thing will fly for a meal. And they come in on the breezes. I took this picture at about ooh, 300 feet in a helicopter. Just north of um, Fernandina Beach, these are all mosquito bark. All mosquito bark. Billions of them. It's incredible. Now, fish will eat these if we allow the fish to get to them, but in many times in the salt marshes, we're not allowed to play with that. Okay, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't allow us to, so we just have to deal with the mosquitoes coming off of it. And some of them may be bothering you folks while you're out there looking at mosquitoes, at uh, uh, stars. 
activities. We mostly think that mosquitoes are active, you know, at dawn and dusk. Well, yeah, they are active at dawn and dusk, but they're also peak activities at other times. Um, this one, 5 to 8 p.m., will claritatus. This is uh, your basic one each government issue mosquito that, that breeds in many different types of things. This is the one, generally, is most active at that time, but it's active at other places. 80s vexans, 9 p.m., prime time for you folks, and 3 a.m., peak, peak activity periods. Anopheles, malaria vectors, we don't have to worry about that too much here. Julix pipiens, the West Nile virus vector, 11 to midnight. Okay, so these things are active when you're active. But by and large, though, mosquitoes become active when you enter their territory and they can sense that you're there. And it doesn't matter whether they're, you know, not supposed to be active at that time or not. This one here, uh, oh, I don't have shit listed here. Here's Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito. Um, <coughs> this one is active whenever you're in. It, it, it's active during the day, during the night, whenever you go into its territory. And if you're wearing shorts out at night, this one's going to tear you up. Okay? This one likes to feed on your lower extremities. So, if you've got these things breeding near you, and this again has a flight range only of 500 feet. So, wherever you're getting bitten, you're breeding them very close by. Uh, if you're sitting down at a table and you're having your morning coffee, this thing's feeding on your ankles. And you don't even know it because it's extremely small. And it does, and it's a very nervous mosquito. So if it is carrying a disease, say dengue or Zika, and it lands on you and you, you're, um, starts feeding, if you just twitch your leg a little, it moves on to someone else to feed. And it'll do that up to 15 times before it's completely fed. So it can infect 15 people. From you, just from that one feeding episode. Very dangerous from speed. Okay. Man, this, this thing is skipping. Um, you can use the keyboard and go back. With the, yeah, I think I'm going to have to do that. There's the, use the arrows and the keyboard down there at the. Yaman, yeah, now we be jamming. <laughs> That's a yellow fever mosquito. This, this too. Um, has a very short flight range, and it's one of the most dangerous creatures on the planet, no question about it. it uh, it's called a yellow fever mosquito because it transmits yellow fever, and yellow fever is coming back. Central and South America, they've had about uh, almost 300,000 cases of yellow fever in the past couple of years, and it's not a fun disease to get. Okay, yeah, no, I think we're better off doing this. <coughs> This is a pretty mosquito. Aedes albopictus, very small. It's a pretty mosquito, as far as mosquitoes. Okay, so how do you keep these things away from you? You do the three Ds. Drain, dress, and defend. By drain, we mean get rid of its breeding habitat. Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito, and Aedes albopictus, the Asian tiger mosquito, are container breeders. Okay, they kind of co-evolved with humans. And as we became a throwaway society, these things flourished. So, first thing you got to do is get rid of all this garbage because they will breed like crazy in these things. When I was in Suriname, South America, doing some work for the World Health Organization, we found 80s aegypti breeding in discarded Coke bottle caps. So you got to be very fastidious about getting rid of this stuff because these things are survivors. So, I mean, this, this place here could be breeding millions of mosquitoes. Okay? And it's very close by, so you need to drain those things, get rid of them. Um, if you've got um, bird feeders, I mean, uh, excuse me, uh, bird baths, empty those out about every five days. Okay, but after you empty them out, you scrub brush right around the top of where the, the the water level was and scrape all that because they're laying the eggs actually above the water line, and when rain comes in, then everything eclodes and hatches. So you got to make sure you do that. But if you do it every five days, you're good to go. You're not going to be breeding any mosquitoes. Okay? Now, mosquitoes' life cycles vary amongst the species, but generally you're talking two, three weeks. Some of them, six months. Felix pipiums can overwinter in your garage or your attic um, and come out uh, feeding uh, in spring. So, uh, oh, just, a, just as a side note, have y'all seen the movie Jurassic Park? I mean, yeah. most everybody has. You know, the first mosquito they show in amber in that thing? Mm -hmm. 
because the Toxrum pagi is rootless, and it's the only species of mosquitoes that doesn't feed on blood. <laughs> and for just a small percentage of the profits, I could have told you. <laughs> well, the actual, the second one they showed wasn't even a mosquito, it's a crane fly. It's like one of these big things that people say, I've got mosquitoes in my house that are huge, massive with the long legs, with well, the crane flies, and they're harmless. Okay, what was online? Okay. Drain. Okay? Drain. Don't worry about, if you've got a fountain, as long as the water's flowing, mosquitoes won't dump. Don't dump. Over positive. Thing. Dress. <coughs> mosquitoes can and will <coughs> bite through um, closely fitting clothing. So wear loose fitting clothing. Now, this is astronomy, so you're doing things generally at night, I would assume. You're not doing them during the day. If you're out during the day, it's best to wear light colored clothing because mosquitoes like, prefer darker colored clothing. They like the contrast and they're attracted to that, okay? So, and you don't want to do this, you don't want to be this. Th these pictures were taken up in Norfolk on a uh, dread spoil island, but uh, it, this is nothing. It gets much worse here. Down on Alligator Alley, they, they get 5,000 bites a minute from people are out there. I mean, just absolutely will drive you crazy. No question about it. So dress, so dress in long pants, loose fitting pants, long sleeves, loose fitting dress. Uh, if you're going to wear, um, you can get a tight weave, like a wool, wool tight weave, weave will keep mosquitoes out. But by and large, it's, it's uh, best to do that, dress properly, and to defend by utilizing an EPA approved insect repellent. Now this is, tends to be a hairy topic because I, you know, I've been doing this for 45 years and I get constantly get phone calls from people saying, well, you know, the real way to get rid of mosquitoes no, why would I know the real way to get rid of mosquitoes? I've been doing it for 45 years. <laughs> they all say that. Well, you got to put toe pee on your arm. Keeps them away all the time. But I mean, they're pee, and they will absolutely swear by that stuff. Dryer sheets is another one. <laughs> Dryer sheets have been tested by EPA uh, for a long time, and they've done double blind studies, and they're absolutely worthless. But people will stick to that kind of stuff. A lot of old wives' tales out there. And a lot of it's due to the fact that People have intrinsic abilities to either attract or disattract mosquitoes, and it's all mediated by your metabolism. Just like your dog can smell you and knows it's you, mosquitoes can smell something and know it's good to eat. Human body puts off about 300 different odors, and they've tested them down at the laboratories down in Gainesville, and some of them are attractive to mosquitoes, some of them are repellent to mosquitoes. And it's just a type of admixture you've got is whether you're going to be more attractive than, uh, say, someone out there on the telescope with you. Okay? Now, there, there's no way. Yes, sir? How about the vitamin B thing? I've heard that for years. No. Nope. Uh, I'm going to show you the things that don't work. <laughs> vitamin B is one of them, unfortunately. <laughs> I mean, everybody's looking for the answer. Uh, I have, had a guy call me up. No, oh, it was back in September. I said, uh, I just bought a four million dollar house on little um, St. Simon's Island. And I got mosquitoes. <coughs> I was thinking to myself, well, you twit, you know? I mean, you built a salt marsh. What do you expect? And he says, that, I mean, it's so bad. I mean, I, I can't, I can't use my swimming pool. What, what, do you, what can I do so that I can use my swimming pool? And I said, down here in Florida, we generally build screen enclosures. Around. Well, I don't want to do that. I came down here to be in with nature. You are with me. <laughs> You're on a menu. What can I say? Um, so there's, you know, people have unrealistic explanations. And, and then he said, you know, well, if you got anything, um, is it, uh, does it work 100% of the time and it's absolutely safe? I said, if I had that, I'd own Little St. Simon's Island. I mean, everybody's looking for that. I mean, and that would be great to have. But, you know, mosquitoes are part of the ecosystem, and we have to do something decidedly unnatural to get rid of them if they're becoming a problem. And they are, as I've told people, the most dangerous creature on the planet by far. Yes, sir? You mentioned the range. Do you get a feel for their ceiling height? How high they fly? <coughs> Generally, it's about 50 to 70 feet max, okay. which is one of the reasons why purple martins don't eat them. Purple That's martin. why I get them up on my roof. Yeah, yeah. Well, a lot of the times that they, they, well, they may be coming out of your gutters, too, at that point. Um, 
Mosquitoes, you know, one good way, particularly if you're um, out stargazing, to keep mosquitoes off of you is keep a, a pretty powerful fan close by. Mosquitoes are not powerful flyers, and they can't circumvent a stiff breeze. You'll notice that if you're out in a stiff breeze, on, you don't get to fly mosquitoes. So this is an easy way, and a non-chemical way, uh, to keep the mosquitoes off you. So I would recommend that. Just one thing. Okay, what was I lying about? All right, defend. Um, Mosquito repellents come generally in either in a lotion form or a spray form. <clears throat> the spray form of is very volatile, and it will start defending you against mosquito bites right off the bat. Lotions tend to be longer lasting, but they take about 20 minutes to take effect. Mm -hmm. So if you're gonna, if you're gonna use a lotion, put it on before you go outside, 10, 15 minutes before you go outside. Yes, sir? I would add that any kind of a lotion that you're gonna have to rub in, Oh, yeah. Instead of getting on the palms of your hands, that might affect when you touch your own eye pieces or... Oh, yeah. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, one thing that we do when we spray, I'll tip my hand back like this and get the inside of the arm, and I hit the back of my hand and do this, mm -hmm. because we don't want to get it on the palms of your hands. Yeah, yeah. good idea. Right. Put it on like a cat. Yeah, like mm -hmm. a cat. We do the cat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. <coughs> I've read about clothing that's impregnated with certain material. Mm -hmm. For nothing. That's it. <laughs> How effective is that? It's very effective, actually. Uh, I, was in the, I was in the Navy for 21 years, and all of our uniforms were impregnated with that. That's yeah. It. yeah, and that's it works good. Uh, not that. just against mosquitoes, but against horse flies, deer flies. Like that. Is that the stuff that comes from geraniums? No. It's well, it's a it's a chemical derivative. Uh, it's a synthetic derivative. Pyrethrum comes from geraniums, okay. and this is a pyrethroid second. Second tier pyrethroid. How many washer cycles does that last? Well, you know, the the owner the owners of the places that do it say up to 75. Okay. I think that's BS, frankly, about 25. Okay. But you know, uh, again, I wouldn't go in, in military. I wouldn't go out in the jungle. And I did a lot of jungle work in Africa with the Marines without wearing something like that. It was great, and it was funny because you'd see a mosquito land on it. It wouldn't repel the mosquito. They would land on it, and it was like they landed on a electric grid. They pull their legs off, you know, and then they fly back about a foot and drop down and go to see Elvis. And so <laughs> they don't get there. <laughs> yes, sir. Hey, Joe. Um, <clears throat> is there anything that you could put out as a bait that would, they would prefer more than they would prefer you? Unfortunately, no. So the they prefer children. Carbon they, dioxide? Well, yeah. They, they, they're, but, You've got to get the right concentration, and the right concentration is what you exhale. What those uh, uh, things like uh, the mosquito, the lido, and there's a couple other uh, those trapping mechanisms. You can't meter the uh, carbon dioxide out to fit a, an attractive profile because if you put too much out there, it actually puts them to sleep and then kills them. As a matter of fact, that's how we. Oh, do yeah, we don't want that. that. No. <laughs> well. I don't. Hey, come on, I'd have to go find honest work. <laughs> Anybody else? Okay. Yeah. Have you, well, there's the one that I was asking about there. But um, we, whenever we're at the swamp there, we usually use a combination of the D. Sometimes I'll bring up and the portable generator. Mm -hmm. We also use a little, what are those things called? There? Thermocell. Uh, put the pad in it, turn it on. Yeah, thermocell. Cells. Thermocells. Yeah, yeah uh, those are probably going to go out of business because uh, D-trans which is the pesticide that's used in it, it's not a repellent. Well, it has repellent properties, but it is a pesticide. It's no longer being manufactured. Um, the problem with area repellents is that they're extreme. There isn't an effective area repellent. Let's put it that way. You get out in the, in the boonies and you get any breeze, that's going to take that repellent right off. Because you need a certain concentration of that repellent as a barrier to confound the mosquito. And when you've got breezes, it just blows that stuff away and uh, it becomes ineffective. And if you look at the thermocells, it says right on the package, avoid breathing the vapors. And there's a reason for that, because it's pesticide. You're just sitting in a cloud of pesticide. I don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling. But they're effective. Hunters use them all the time. They swear by them. Okay. So, EPA registered repellents. And I say only use EPA registered repellents. You go on the internet, there's millions of them out there. Repellents. 
I only use, we, I, well, as a professional, professional, I can only recommend EPA registered. If it's an EPA registered repellent, it means two things, that it's safe to use as directed, and that it will give you a minimum of two hours of protection. Now, there are other stuff out there on the internet that may give you longer protection, but it hasn't been tested by EPA. Okay, so you don't know. And, and I have people all the time saying, well, I got an independent laboratory to do this. And uh, then I ask them, why didn't you submit it to EPA for approval? Well, they wanted me to do some other things. Well, I would want you to do some other things too. Because literally, if you're using an ineffective repellent, it could be a matter of life and death, literally, if you're not using the right stuff. You could get bitten by mosquitoes that carry lethal diseases. We have eastern equine encephalitis in this area. Have about two cases a year. That's about 75% fatal. And what it doesn't kill turns into vegetables. So you don't want to get bitten by mosquitoes if you can help it. So you've got to use the stuff that really works. So the first one, the gold standard by which all our, our um, judge is deep. It was formulated in 1956 down at, uh, in Gainesville, Florida, at the USDA labs down there. <coughs> and it's still uh, the standard by which all other repellents are judged. Uh, it can be used on infants. It does, actually, there is no lower limit to the, uh, the age you can use it on infants. Now, would I use it on infants? No, I keep my own mosquitoes. Duh. But it's the only one, that and picaridin are the only two that don't have any strictures against use on children. The only um, natural one we have, well, I mean, eucalyptus, you're not allowed to use it on children le less than three years old. Because it is toxic. That's what people fail to realize. Just because it's natural doesn't mean it's non-toxic. So, DEET, if you're going to use DEET, use about a 30% formulation. Okay, the repellency plateaus at about 30%. If you're using 100%, you might get an hour or two extra Okay, above the four hours that you're going to get, but it's not going to be any more repellent than the uh, 30 percent. Oil of lemon eucalyptus, you should use about um, 40, 45 percent oil of lemon eucalyptus, and you're going to smell like oil of lemon eucalyptus. So it was a tough sell with the Marines when I was in the Navy. They didn't like that stuff. The keratin, which is my favorite, is the highest selling repellent in the world outside of the United States. And it's, it's a synthetic uh, derivative of pepper plants. It's preparity. So it's got kind of a natural pedigree to it. It's got a very soft feel, doesn't smell. So, and it works. Every bit as good as deep. So that's the one I would recommend. But, you know, any of these. Is there a brand name for that, sir? Uh, Picaridin, yeah, Sawyer. Sawyer makes it. I think I've got a slide here that shows uh, what Sawyer products makes. And is that what they're using in South America? Uh, no. I'm not using anything in South America, okay. unfortunately. Well, you got to remember, they, it's a whole different culture down there. Yeah, and there's a lot of misinformation being played out, but particularly in Puerto Rico, uh, where they, they really screwed the pooch on that. Where it, and people were dying, and they are putting out misinformation about utilizing repellents and things like that. It's, it's, it's shameful, but it happened. Uh, IR 35, 35 was developed by CDC, and um, it's a uh, amino propionic acid, which is a, uh, a derivative of beta alanine, which is a natural occurring amino acid. So this one also has a uh, natural pedigree to it. And it's effective. I mean, in tests, you'll get 85% repellency with this versus 98% on that, and you probably wouldn't notice the difference. So if, if that's the way you want to go, knock yourself out. I think there's about 17 products on the market uh, with IR3535. There's 15 picaridin and 170 D. Uh, DuPont just came out with catnin oil, okay? Uh, Napactolone. And it's a very effective repellent. Every bit as effective as, as D. Unfortunately, it's catnip. So you're going to be real friends with every cat in here. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. I'll use something else. <laughs> Not that I don't like cats, but I don't like hundreds of cats. <laughs> but it does repel a mosquito. No question about it. And ticks. Oh, by the way, uh, for uh, picaridin, choose a, about a 17 to 20 percent formulation of picaridin. At that uh, concentration, it's also um, 
it's also repellent to ticks. The 7% formulation is not repellent to ticks, but the 20% is. Oh, okay. okay, here's D. This repels 10 hours. Yeah, sure it does. Um, no, it, it'll give you a good solid 7, 8 hours, though, this, this 100% D. Uh, and D has always had some cosmetic issues, the smell, greasy feel, plasticizing things. It's not something, to me, I would use around a telescope at all. But they, the manufacturers have noticed that it has these characteristics, and they are now uh, engineering them out of the product, so that the Avon products, by and large, are scent free and greasy, feel free. I noticed it started eating my uh, rubber caps on my binoculars. Oh yeah, it'll eat with a little fog up watch mm -hmm. crystals in a heartbeat too. You don't use it while you're, you're going to spray it. You have to be away from your equipment. Right. So everybody knows it will eat your coatings. It's yeah. the same chemical they use to do the windshield. <coughs> the, mm -hmm. the light covers make them clear. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, here's the repel uh, lemon eucalyptus oil, lemon eucalyptus bottle there, pump spray. Good stuff, but I'm not keen on smelling like a lemon. Here's the keratin. <coughs> lotion. And here it's 20%, 20% lotion. Good stuff. Good stuff. There's IR3535 by OZ. <coughs> Of course, it says deep free. Um, it's, I mean, so pe some people have some weird ideas about the deep. Uh, they, the World Health Organization did a seven year study uh, back in 2004 2011 on deep use. Six billion applications of deep worldwide, and the only untoward uh, effects they had were 60 uh, dermatitis that were resolved as soon as people washed it off. So, and, and people think that it's going to kill their babies and stuff like that. No, no, no. Six billion? Six, six billion, yeah. But you get about two, three hundred million a year usages of heat. It's, it's extraordinarily well tested and safe. But no, you can never say something safe. Right. And say that you know it won't it won't harm you generally if used according to labor specifications. But by and large, sixty dermatitis out of six billion applications is pretty safe. Yes, sir. Does this product eat plastic or? You know, I don't know. Okay. Sorry, I, I do not know. A lot of it depends on the eating the plastic is the inner ingredients that put in it in order to stabilize it so that it takes some of the volatility out of it or, or at least uh, regulates the volatility. Okay, okay this is a pattern. This is catnip. And there's like seven products out there and it's every bit as good as beef. It's an excellent, excellent product. I, I just would use it. A lot of these things, you know, the best repellent is the one you're actually going to use. There's no is perfect it, repellent. Is it safe for cats? <laughs> you know, that's a good question because cats have been known to eat the plants of this and yeah, die from it. That's what I was wondering. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I, I'd have to look it up on the internet. <laughs> well, if you go to the National Pest. National Pesticide Information Center at Oregon State University, NPIC, at Oregon State University. They've got documents, toxicology documents on all of the products. It's very, very, very good. You tell them what critter you want to repel and they'll tell you how to help. Okay, infector repellents, garlics. <laughs> If you slathered yourself in garlic, it would repel mosquitoes for about 20 minutes. Then you have to do it again. Repel your wife a lot longer. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Vitamin B, nope, unfortunately, doesn't work. And it's been, it's been tested quite a bit because everybody's looking for it. Well, wouldn't that be cool if it really did you know, mosquitoes? And again, when it's done by amateurs who don't follow particular protocols that EPA says, it may be, the mosquitoes might be being repelled by something totally different than the vitamin B. They just haven't factored out all the compounds in there. <coughs> ultrasound, oh, well, this is a sexy one. Unfortunately, ultrasound doesn't work. Doesn't work on cockroaches. The Federal Trade Commission 
uh, nailed a couple companies who were making uh, cases that this could lower your, your risk of getting a West Nile virus using ultrasound, and they got sued for that by the FTC. It's, it's absolutely not true. Dryer sheets is another one. No. Bug zappers. Bug zappers aren't really good at killing mosquitoes. They will kill mosquitoes. But uh, the stuff you hear, the, the, you know, the zap, 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 um, is actually uh, more like moths, June beetles, things of that, that nature that it's killing. Uh, they've done studies at Notre Dame University, and they've used bug zappers on you know, properties over a summer, and you get about a 13% reduction in mosquitoes, which is, you know, 13%, but, you know, it's not saving you anything by and large. Um, <coughs> birds and bats. <coughs> Unfortunately, they don't work either. Now, birds, there are species of birds that will eat uh, mosquitoes when there's a lot of them available. But think about it for a second, and the same thing with bats. How much energy does that critter have to expend to capture a mosquito, and how much return on that investment is it getting from eating a mosquito? No. Bats, in particular, are, you know, they're opportunistic feeders. And they will feed on something bigger before they'll feed on something smaller. They have been known to eat mosquitoes. And actually, they've done some studies in Australia where they found that um, bats will actually shift their feeding activity to coincide with the salt marsh mosquitoes that are being bred in certain places in Australia. So, but the fact is, is that mosquitoes do not constitute the primary dietary, dietary source of anything. Okay, unfortunately. Are they the dragonflies? No. Now, actually, dragonflies are daytime bites. Daytime people, that's what a lot of guys do. That's how they do. And uh, you know what is the primary food source of dragonflies? Pollinators. Bees. Bees. Yeah. You don't want, and, and I have people all the time say, well, you know, you, what you need to do is you just need to put 20 million dragonflies in that area. That'll clean out the mosquitoes. That'll clean out your bees. And uh, your wasps. And clean out your butterflies. <laughs> You gotta be real careful because when honeybees. Pardon? Honeybees. Yeah. Yeah, they'll, they'll clean out honeybees in a heartbeat. And their their nymphs are voracious predators in water. And they will eat mosquito larvae when they come in contact with them, but they are bottom feeders. The mosquitoes are up at the top of the water column. What they do feed on voraciously are the little mosquito fish that feed on mosquito larvae. Yeah. So there you don't want to introduce those into your Okay, so so bats, not a real good idea. If you put a bat box up, you know, bats are beautiful critters in their own way. I think they're cool. I got a lot of them around my house. But don't put up a bat house thinking that it's going to solve your mosquito problem because it won't. Same thing with birds. Purple martin houses are a big thing. Purple martins feed during the day, not at night when the mosquitoes are out. And they feed at about 70 to 100 feet up in the air. Mosquitoes aren't up there. I told you they're a lot. Uh, lower than that. It's funny because this guy that it was first brought to attention that these things feed on mosquitoes by a gentleman, I can't remember his name offhand, but he was walking along the road one day, he was an amateur ornithologist, and he saw a dead purple mark on the road, and he took it back to his garage and opened it up to find out, you know, just what, what it was eating and, you know, what uh, its, uh, it's uh, health status was. And he found two mosquitoes in its gut. He said, well, damn, I wonder how many, if these things eat mosquitoes, how many mosquitoes would it have to eat in order to stay alive? Because they've got a highly uh, rapid metabolism. So he worked out all of the, uh, all of the math, and a four ounce purple martin would have to consume 14,000 mosquitoes a day to survive. <coughs> so just as a kind of tongue in cheek thing, he sent in a scientific note to the Audubon Society saying these things could possibly eat 14,000 mosquitoes a day. He said, could possibly. He didn't say they did. They could possibly. Well, Audubon Society uh, published that in one of its magazines, and ever since, every purple martin eats 14,000 mosquitoes a day. That's how those things happen. Uh, the, the president of the Purple Martin Society uh, in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, James Hill, says that's nonsense. It's ridiculous. But this guy just so happens to make purple martin houses, houses and he makes a fortune off of it. But again, we may be talking about in terms of life and death, so you've got to really uh, do the good stuff. Okay. Now, 
American if you want further information, the American Mosquito Control Association website is there, www.mosquito.org. Or you can contact me, I live on Fleming Island. At uh, this common AMCATA gmail.com. <coughs> on my phone here. This is what they pay me this exorbitant wage to do, so please uh, feel free to, to do a call. Yes, ma'am. Those little vehicles that ride around spraying all this stuff all over my neighborhood, mm -hmm. the mosquito control people, what are they using? Probably uh, permethrin. And they don't spray it all over the neighborhood. This is this is this is highly regulated by EPA. Highly regulated. And if they are spraying stuff all over the neighborhood, then you need to inform the boss of that. And I had to do that once. Clay County. I live in Eagle Harbor. And about one o'clock in the afternoon one day, I'm on the computer and I see this truck going around the spring. I ran out the front door and stopped the, the lady who was doing it and said, What the hell are you doing? I'm killing mosquitoes. No, you're not. I mean, mosquitoes aren't out at this time of the day flying around. You're not killing mosquitoes. And I asked her, you know, what chemical were you were using? What's the flow rate on the uh, ultra low volume machine you've got? And what's it? Uh, <laughs> I, I started questioning about that. She, she got frustrated. I said, well, damn, what the hell do you know about it anyway? I said, well, I happen to know quite a bit about this. <laughs> you know? um, so I called up her boss. I, I didn't want to get her in trouble other than the fact that she's out there poisoning the neighborhood. That's all she's doing. So <clears throat> people all the time say that they're just out spraying at night. Uh, they have to put out a particular spray droplet size. It's very, very difficult to achieve. What they're putting out with permethrin is about 0.47 ounces per acre. And they're drifting it through an air column 10 feet above the ground. So you're talking about 400 and 40,000 cubic feet of air that they're pushing 0.47 ounces of product through. That is, that is broken up into extremely fine, 17 to 20 micron particles to do. So it may, it may look like they're spraying stuff all over the place, they're not. Because they can get in big trouble doing that. And they should get in big trouble doing that. Yes, ma'am. My grandmother used to have one of the home remedies, mm -hmm. camphor for me. How does that work? That's an old, that's an old school thing. Yeah, uh, it's got some, it's work? got some repellent properties to it. Yeah, but I mean, it's not nearly as effective as the, the stuff that's engineered now. The stuff that's engineered now is engineered to be both safe, um, acceptable to the public to use, long lasting to a certain extent, and a wide range of repellency. Because mosquitoes, are, you know, as I said, there's 176 mosquitoes, uh, 185 mosquito species in the United States. And while there's considerable overlap, there are differences among species as to what they feed on, uh, when they're uh, active, where they breed, and indeed uh, to their uh, refractiveness to mosquito repellents. Anopheles albumanus, the vector of malaria in Central and South America, is not repelled by DEET at all. Why? We don't know. Nobody's been able to figure it out. So, but there are other things to use. So, there's a lot of differences in mosquitoes. Yes, ma'am. We um, walk our dog in a park mm -hmm. and it's surrounded by water and you'll see a mosquito or two land on her. What's safe to use on pets? I, I can't answer that. that. That's a veterinarian would have to answer that because although dogs are pretty, can tolerate, you know, uh, uh, pesticides, cats cannot. Mm -hmm. You can't not use stuff on cats, period. But that's really a, a question a veteran, veterinarian should answer. I would use, I've got a wonderful golden retriever and I wouldn't use anything on her. Uh, but you, you need to just give them, you know, heartworm medicine because heartworm is, is very uh, prevalent in this area. Is there anything we can spray our property with? No. That's effective? No. Okay. No, and unfortunately there's a lot of these pest control companies now that are getting into the mosquito control business and all they're doing is spraying out residual pesticides on your shrubbery and things like that so that Will it kill mosquitoes landing upon it that are resting during the day? Yeah. It will also kill ladybugs. Uh, it will also kill anything else that lands on there. So I'm not a big proponent of that at all, even though that is registered, a registered use by the EPA. I'm not, I'm not big on that. So the area foggers and that kind of stuff? Well, the foggers, you know, the, those thermal foggers, um, you can get them, like it's a Black & Decker at Home Depot. Yeah. 
um, they can clear an area out for several hours. So if you're going to have, um, you know, a, a, a wedding, you know, in your backyard or something like that, mm -hmm. uh, spraying, and it's going to be at night, you know, spraying uh, at dawn, at dusk, excuse me, could clear out the mosquitoes for a couple hours. But be advised that these things are, they'll kill everything else they contact, too. <clears throat> so, you know, there's, there's cost and benefits. Uh, yes, sir. Citronella candles? Citronella is a bona fide repellent, but it's a weak repellent. And the fact that you've got it outside means that any breeze, uh, any type of uh, humidity uh, is going to uh, lower its effectiveness considerably. So, but it is a bona fide repellent. As I said, the military, and the military is being, uh, a lot of the research on this type of stuff for the military is done down at the Center for Medical, Agriculture, and Veterinary um, Entomology, <coughs> and a big group of buildings next to the University of Florida campus and they've been looking for a uh, kind of a push-pull type of setup where it would push the mosquitoes away from you and pull them towards something that will kill them and they've been working on it for 15 years they still haven't come up with something that works as well as they want it to but it's something they want to find believe me yes sir is there anything good that the mosquito does Keeps me from having to eat out of dumpsters, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's no benefit. No, no, and, and that's funny because, you know, uh, humans tend to think of, uh, of critters in terms of how, how well they, how valuable they are to humans. And mosquitoes exist for one reason and one reason only, to make more mosquitoes. That's it. That's it. And, but if mosquitoes all died tomorrow, the ecosystem would hiccup and then continue to march. Now, something worse might fill its niche. I mean, you know, lawyers or something like that. <laughs> so, I, I've been asked that, you know, by the folks at the MIT all the time. Well, what happened if we lost all the mosquitoes? Hell, we lost all the dinosaurs. We survived that. So, yeah. But How about you never DDT? know. Pardon? How about DDT? Don't want to use that. It's effective, extremely effective. Still is in certain cases, but there's a lot of resistance to it. Uh, it's not nearly as dangerous as people think it is. Right. No one has ever died. There were people that ate it. That were oh yeah. To well, it, it was it was one of those things that it was just so good at what it does that we failed to realize we got to do a lot of other things rather than just spray pesticides around. So it made us lazy, complacent, and um, the environment suffered for it because it it takes like 20 years to go away. Uh, it's a it's a very stable chemical and. I don't get a warm, fuzzy feeling about having that stuff out there, but I've handled DDT uh, when I was in Gabon. They were using it for malaria control there. And when I was a kid, we sprayed it all around right before it was out mm -hmm. mm -hmm. We pumped it back stuff out of gallon into the air and sprayed all our neighborhoods. Well, it's, it's, it, it'll kill insects. There's no question about yeah. that. No question about that. But here again, it was just too good for its own good, frankly. Okay. And we got a lot of things that now don't, that, that aren't as, um, stable in the environment to go away. Like these ultra low volume insecticides I was talking about for the spray tr trucks, those things are active for about an hour and a half. And then they deactivate. So. Same thing with the planes down in South Florida? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. What about the Avon? Spinosaur? Spinosaur. Yeah. yeah. Well, they, they've got a number of different formulations that have uh, DD in it. <coughs> but the original Avon skin so soft. It didn't have any repellent in it. it what it did, you put it on your skin and the mosquitoes become trapped in it and drown. Yeah. <laughs> Which, when you think about it, it's kind of neat. <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, but it's also a skin, it, it was meant to be diluted in, you know, 100 gallons of water. So when you put it directly on your skin, you get some uh, contact dermatitis. And you get a lot of contact <coughs> dermatitis. Now, there are essential oils that will work against mosquitoes. Unfortunately, at the concentrations you have to use it against mosquitoes, they're very toxic. Mm -hmm. Oil of cloves is one. Mm -hmm. Oil of cloves will, will uh, repel mosquitoes at a 25% concentration. However, it will also burn a hole right through your skin at that concentration. And it doesn't smell like oil of cloves at that concentration. <laughs> so, and a lot of repellent, um, less than reputable repellent types will say contains oil of cloves, a known mosquito repellent. All right, that's not at the concentration there.